Well, to give us some insight regarding what's happening on the southern border, we welcome via the Zoom line a man who comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, he's considered a governance expert, and we welcome a Dr. Fitzgerald Yo. Um, by all means, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Yao, I want to say, uh, yo, um, you know, by all means, uh, thank you for the time. And we look at some of the developments coming, uh, obviously, on the southern border. It's very much in the public domain. We understand there's going to be some dialogue uh, this week on the 14th, to be exact. And I was seeing this morning in my monologue, I think dialogue is important. When people stop talking, that is when we should get a bit nervous. So by all means, thank you for the time, and I look forward to our conversation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. Let me ask you, the dialogue, um, obviously, mm -hmm. some, are su some are suggesting, well, they don't suspect much will come out of it, but I still believe it's important that these two leaders uh, meet in St. Vincent and talk. And, and strangely enough, uh, you know, what's your perspective on the meeting place, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Well, the, the meeting place is, is, is to me, useful because uh, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is close to uh, Mr. Maduro, President of Venezuela. He's also close to President Ali of Guyana. Um, St. Vincent, of course, is a CARICOM member, Guyana is a CARICOM member, of course. So I think the location is a good one because both leaders would be comfortable there. And as you said, it's much better to be talking and, and talking closely rather than be shouting over the airwaves and so forth. It's a great opportunity for leaders to sit down and try to t calm things down. Of course, the issue of the border is not up for discussion in the sense of any resolution between the two leaders. That is now with the International Court of Justice, and that is where it belongs correctly following international law. So, but the, 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 the leaders sitting down and talking about the, the issues that would inevitably be there between two countries that share a border, um, share a continent, and so on. There, there must be other issues that can be talked about, and the leaders seeing each other and understanding directly from each other where things are is much better than shouting over long distances. Well, I'm watching even President De Silva, who also shares a border with Guyana, the Brazilian president, is also part of the discussions. Any perspective as to him being there, it's important, you think, uh, the Brazilian president is part of this? That is very important. Brazil is a major country in the world. It's a major country in South America, of course. It shares a border with both Guyana and Venezuela. So they're very much uh, a key player in all of this, you know. And so it's very good, in fact, that um, the Brazilian president is going to be part of this discussion. Brazil is a key player. If you were to process. give advice to President Ali from Guyana, what would be your advice in terms of his approach, his demeanor, his tenure, his tenor going into this meeting? Because you know Maduro uh, seems to be, at least from a distance, looking on. He seems to be this kind of hard man, uh, big in stature, in size, in voice. Uh, he comes with, obviously, uh, massive population, military prowess, connections to Russia. So, so there is lots going in, and Guyana, um, obviously backed by the CARICOM and, you know, obviously the president being very firm with his words. Uh, what should be the approach if he was to give him advice going into this high-level meeting on the 14th? Well, let's start by saying for us that Guyana also has um, very important friends around the world, you know, starting with our neighbor Brazil and going beyond that. So, so the real key here is that we need to get away from this machismo thing that, you know, and, and really Look at this in terms of these are two leaders and they're meeting to talk about issues that surround countries that share borders. Um, we have the important issue of the arbitral award and various issues with that, but that is before the International Court of Justice. So we leave that off and we just sit down as calm leaders and try to just tone down the rhetoric and just face the issues that we can discuss that, that are part of neighbors, you know. Um, they're, look at Canada, the U.S., um, the EU. You know, neighboring countries always need to talk to each other because they are common issues, you know. So there are a lot of stuff that we need to talk about. 
and do it in a way where um, there's mutual respect. That's the main thing that we have to have, mutual respect, and, and everything else falls into place. Mutual respect, respect for international law. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, that's, zone of peace. That's, that's always best on paper, but when we look at some of the recent developments, especially with President Maduro taking to his Twitter account and literally redrawing the Venezuela map, adding on the disputed area, and putting that out as an official, I guess, uh, adjustment, as it were, to the Venezuelan, landmass uh, one really wonders or at least if you're a fly on the wall in that meeting i really wonder what will be the approach um obviously again from president ali and and, and even maduro and of course well the brazilian president there in the mix mediating uh, said discussion i i really hope as we said earlier they're talking so that's important but i know there is lots of feelings going into the said meeting well, look, uh, the Venezuela is a sovereign country, Gaza is a sovereign country. The Venezuelan president can say whatever he wants. You know, he is the leader of Venezuela. He can say whatever he wants. And in fact, a lot of people think that the issues he's talking about is more to his domestic agenda, the issues he's facing. See, the, the key is that after talk, the talk is followed up by respect for international law. So, you know, he can say whatever he wants, but once it doesn't cross the border in terms of Venezuelan forces coming to do anything in Guyana, that's fine. He can speak whatever he wants. Part of the good thing that could come out of the discussion is that he sees the, that he, he feels that his domestic agenda is satisfied and he can tone down the rhetoric, but it's just rhetoric. Once he does not do anything that violates the sovereignty of Guyana, that's the real key. You know, he's a, it's a sovereign country. He's a leader of that country, and he's free to speak. But he also has to understand and respect international law within the context of the things he might be planning to do. You know, as you take it to, as you, as you took it there to the domestic political front, obviously, I guess it could work in the favor of both leaders because, yes, Maduro could lift his voice and, I guess, raise a fire in Venezuela, and then, of course, it could just calm down. And, of course, on the Guyanese side, in terms of the approach by the president taking his particular stance, standing firm against what seems to be, uh, uh, well, at least on paper, a very strong neighbor. This could also work in President Ali's favor in terms of bolstering support and being able to, to stand firm and show the Ghanese people that he is uh, the leader for, for the occasion. Well, you know, there are some things that come with incumbency. However, what President Ali is representing and going forward and, uh, and the meeting on the 14th is not a President Ali position. It's a Guyana position. He is the president of Guyana at this point in time, and he's representing what has been a long-established Guyanese position. So to the extent that he um, goes to that meeting and maintains that it really is maintain what he should be maintaining as the president of Ghana representing what has been Ghana's position on this issue since it began really you know and it began you know even before Ghana became independent and um, it has flowed on since so he he really just is representing a national consensus from Ghana in terms of what's the situation regarding the relationships between Venezuela and Ghana Dr. Yao, what's your take on CARICOM's position uh, regarding the dispute? Well, CARICOM's position has always been consistent that um, they recognize the sovereignty of Guyana over there as a quibble. They stand firmly with Guyana. They understand fully that the process is correctly now with the International Court of Justice. Um, so CARICOM is, has been consistent. I mean, uh, Guyana is not the only CARICOM country with a, with a border issue. Um, Belize also has an issue, but um, CARICOM has been um, firm, I think. Not, there's nothing wrong with the CARICOM position as a whole. Let me ask you, what's, what's the resolution really going forward? I mean, obviously, we're going to say goodbye to 2023. I suspect after this talk, we could probably see some more developments taking place. And, of course, we, as mentioned, will wait for the judgment of uh, the international courts but what could be and should be the way forward and a proper resolution so this does not rear its ugly head 20 40 50 years from now because again 1899 it's far removed from where we are now in 2023 and this is still a talking point so i, I wonder what is the ultimate solution going forward the ultimate solution really is Venezuela 
going back to accepting the 1899 arbitral award because it's very important for us to remember that Venezuela was a part of the process in 1899. Venezuela was represented by the U.S. basically. The U.S. was, you could say, in 1899 was Venezuela's sponsor in this whole process. Venezuela signed off happily to what was said to be a full, final, and perfect agreement. They went along with the demarcation of the border based on that 1899 agreement. They have issued postal stamps which indicate their acceptance of the border. So, you know, um, it basically is Venezuela just coming around back to where they were, which is that they fully accepted the current border with Guyana and Brazil. Because Brazil also is part of it, because Brazil, Guyana, and Venezuela, at, um, at a certain point, do share a border. You know, all three countries intersect at a certain point. You know, so this thing was accepted. So we, so the International Court of Judgment makes its ruling based on the facts. The ruling would maintain the existing um, border between Guyana and Venezuela. And so the, the Venezuelans just have to go back to where they were, which is to accept that, and things will be fine. Um, so that's that's really the long term, and part of it is Guyana continue to exercise sovereignty over Essequibo, and to continue to develop the region, and um, we're doing that, and there are some things we're doing with with um, Brazil, and we want to do more with Venezuela down the line. Of course, once they are, it's been done in the context of the 1899 arbitral award, which, as I said, I, I need to repeat it, Venezuela was a willing signatory to that process yeah, and again they had no issues yeah, and that was way before all of our time you know but let me ask you uh, dr yao what is the mood within or at least what you're hearing is the mood around the diplomatic circles and even more so on the ground in guyana where many venezuelans the now call guyana home uh, people would have come across for a better life to just uh, be part of the economic uh, uh, wheel that is now turning in a major way in Guyana, uh, what's the general mood and, and, and relations with the actual people, far removed from these high-level talks? Okay, Guyana is a very welcoming country. Uh, one of the things we must note is that some of the persons coming back to, you know, we use the term refugees, why, um, you know, loosely, but however, um, based on the movement of people to Guyana from Venezuela, some of them are actually people who have legal links to Guyana because some Guyanese had moved to Venezuela, so some of them are returning, some of their children are returning, so some of those people have legal links to Guyana in any case. There are Venezuelans who we could say were, bo were bo uh, born Venezuelans who are coming across again based on the economic situation in Venezuela. That tide will reverse, of course, when things change around in, in Venezuela, hopefully sooner rather than later. But, you know, we have to continue to exercise our due diligence in terms of those persons coming across. But generally, they are not sympathetic to Maduro's position. They, some of them have called publicly saying that they don't support what Maduro is trying to do. Um, you know, so we, we continue to work with them. We have to be wise, of course, you know. Uh, but it, the, the, the fact is that it, it, the same way that Guyanese had migrated to other places, people migrate all over the world for various reasons, not only for economic reasons, but, you know, people want to travel, see different things, have different experiences, careers, and so forth. So movement of people globally is, is going to continue. So that, you know, sometimes it's pushed by events that makes things move, movements larger than they really ought to be, uh, which is the case now with Venezuela's Wales coming across to Guyana just because of the economic situation there. Um, so we, we really don't have a, a problem with that as an, as a, uh, an issue. It's, we just have to be careful. Um, Guyanese are generally, you know, watching on what's happening. Uh, we have heard this type of rhetoric from, from Venezuela before. It has changed significantly now because of the oil resource, oil and gas resources that have been confirmed. We always believed they were there based on the neighborhood. So and in that regard, and in that regard, let me ask you, as we look to wrap things up, uh, do you believe based on the fines and so much attention now is being paid to Guyana, and again, the economic wheels are turning. Could this dispute to the gray area regarding the border impact that economic, uh, that economic prowess right now that Guyana is currently experiencing? Yeah, that's one of the fundamental issues because the, currently the oil and gas resources that have put Guyana on the global stage um, those 
oil and gas related offshore, and it's Guyana's because of the Essequibo region, you know. So that's a very important fact. But it's important to remember as well, we went back to 1899, that the Venezuelans started this false issue somewhere in the 1960s. So it's that that being an issue that they have raised just because um, oil and gas has been commercially determined to, you know, of course, gas is a producer now. So it's been, we're a commercial producer of oil, uh, oil and gas now. So um, the that is not the only issue it has been there you know this false issue was raised since the 60s so um oil and gas just kind of adds a different dimension and it doesn't change the fact that venezuela had signed on to a full final and perfect agreement with regards to the borders in 1899 so the issue of oil and gas it's uh, not a factor but it's not something with it's not a new thing which is now causing this this um, border issue to be um to be revived and they've been you know pushing it and so on for, for, for years but it's still put, put pushing a wrong argument for many years doesn't make it right of course fully still understood fully understood uh, dr yeah i want to say uh sincere thanks for joining us this morning giving some clarity giving that perspective again uh coming from your uh well through your lens uh again with your wealth of experience and uh, you being a governance expert um, hopefully this discussion the high-level talks this week could yield some kind of clear roadmap to, to resolution going forward, and at least they're talking, you know, and that's important, is when leaders stop talk is when we go into serious problems. All the best, and let's probably touch base sometime in the new year. Thank you very much, Jason. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. That's uh, Dr. Fitzgerald Yaw, the governance expert out of Guyana giving us some details concerning that dispute. Let's take a pause. We come back and head across to COP28 for the latest. Ryan B. Chu stands by for developments out there in Dubai. See you soon.